Good morning and welcome once again to The Breakfast. The Commissioner for Education, Folashade Adifisayo, has confirmed resumption for private and public schools in Lagos State from Monday, November 2nd, 2020. Boarding schools are to resume on Sunday, the first of the same month. And uh, we will be joined this morning by uh, Bukola Adibi, the president of uh, Jackin NGO. Thank you so much for joining us and good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm going to um, start with asking your opinion on the uh, school resumption when it seems violence may not be fully abated across Lagos. Uh, there's still, you know, little security concerns here and there. Um, do you think it is the right time? Okay, from my own um, perspective, I believe the children are overdue to resume. And um, also, the violence is still in some few places, which I want to believe that communities affected would have communicated with the Ministry of Education. So I want to believe that most likely they are going to give them some special consideration. All right. Um, the school calendar also, you know, has been distorted as a result of COVID-19 and all the issues that we've had recently. How do you think schools will be able to adjust to a new reality and be able to fit every student who comes in or comes back to school to what they are supposed to be doing at uh, this time? Frankly, it's going to be a very tough one, especially for children, most vulnerable children because there's going to be a huge imbalance. Um, quite a number of the children that are most vulnerable did not have access to on-air or online education all through the lockdown. While those that are in private schools also have their own imbalance, for the um, private schools that are not low income, they were able to have online education constantly. While those that are low income had very huge, huge um, challenges with having the online classes. So the first set of things to even do is to uh, assess students per school. And then the school authorities would have to know how to manage the calendar in such a way that they can have either morning and afternoon classes. There has to be some form of extension. At least all through this year, 2020, if they resume um, next week, Monday now, they have roughly six weeks till the end of 2020, and they already lost the whole term. So the kind of crash work is unimaginable. And even having them go on um, Christmas and New Year break, it might still be advisable for schools that identify huge gap in their um, students or pupils to equally look at how they can have maybe some form of um, lessons or homework or something that the children can do to catch up during the Christmas and New Year break. So it's not going to be business as usual at all with the education calendar um, till next year. All right, I, I want to move the conversation um, away from the students now to the parents. Um, the whole of 2020 has come with you know, a lot of economic challenges here and there. Um, if you speak to many parents, they will tell you how they, you know, currently will be struggling to keep up with uh, payment of school fees at a time like this. And of course, because of uh, the, the crash that you've just mentioned now with the terms, um, there's, there's going to be rushing into third term. Um, of course, 2021 also, there's expected to be new school fees paid again. Um, what would you say, you know, might be done or should be done to assist parents at a time like this um, to get their kids back to school? I think it starts with um, the private schools, both the low income and the high income ones. The government are, might have to support the schools to be able to give parents some form of discount. Because for most of even these private schools, they tend to get loans to support um, the, the financial management of the school throughout a new session. And as it's where right now, they are going to have those loans to be covered. 
So even the banks would have to support them one way or the other. For the ones that are attending government schools also, most parents are going to be struggling seriously to get them new school uniforms and all that. I know children grow. Whether they go to school or not, there's likely to be a huge number of children that will resume after the lockdown and their school uniforms and school sandals are no longer their sizes. So they are going to also have issues with that, of which again, the same way the government is making um, provision to support businesses to bounce back after the lockdown, there has to be a way they, they are going to support students in school. Maybe give them free school uniforms, um, textbooks, exercise books, even school sandals and the likes, things that the government has never done before. That is a very good way they can, you know, reduce a lot of burden on parents. And then quite a number of all the um, unexpected charges or mandatory charges that they still give children in public schools can be cancelled for now, at least to relieve um, caregivers and allow them bounce back after the lockdown. It's a good thing that the government is already um, doing a lot of initiatives, you know, to release support to businesses and artisans and the like, but we have to ask ourselves, how many artisans do we have in the whole of Nigeria? How many artisans can be able to benefit from this? So again, the government has to do as much assessment as they can do to identify families and businesses that are most ad, um, affected so that they can equally relieve um, the, these caregivers of the burden of sending the children back to school. I sincerely pray that the school feeding program will be continued and it can be able to reach especially most vulnerable population of children in school because that is another thing that parents of um, orphans and vulnerable children or caregivers of orphans and vulnerable children do struggle with. Let's also take a look at the performance of these children and I expect, or these students and our expectations of them. You mentioned, you know, the crash work that they would have to be faced with. Uh, those who go to Open University, for instance, last month were forced to go back to school and started exams immediately after being away for a couple of months. I'm just wondering if that's the best bet, you know, the options that we have, because in other climes, for instance, the assessment of students was different based on the fact, you know, the grades that they had before all of the lockdown issues started. Is this our best bet? Are there other ways to assess the students? Because clearly you would expect that not most of them would perform well because they've not been in school. And like you mentioned, not most of them, most of them don't have access to maybe internet and e-learning. How other ways, is there other ways that we should begin to explore as what COVID has taught us in the assessment of students in education? Well, I, I, I want to believe, frankly, that it wasn't right for the children, um, students to resume school, even for those that wrote to IEC and the likes. Many of those children were not prepared at all. And even for those in open university, well, they may even be a bit better because they're grown up and they should be able to read on their own. But you know, even when you are having um, physical classes, a lot of children don't even catch up. How much more when you're now doing virtual or online for them, it's going to be quite difficult for those that have never been doing it before. For those that maybe their school was a mix, which is most prevalent in um, private schools, where children use um, computer to learn and all that from day one, it's going to be a walkover. And they're writing the same way. For those that are going to be doing stuff online and um, maybe um, virtual too, it's not going to be easy. I would have suggested that they give those um, students at least some time to do some crash revision. And for most of, for them again, it would have been better to have conducted like a mock exam to, or a test to even assess where they are like a, something like an impromptu or a pretest to check where those students are as at resumption. And this will let them know if they are ready for this exam because the exam that they are writing affects their future, affects their grades in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So it would have been better for them to have conducted like an impromptu pretest, something that the children are not even prepared for. At least test where they are and then do like two weeks or three weeks or four weeks you know, intensive revision for them 
and do a post test to see what comes out of them before you bombard them with the exams. I want to believe that it's totally unfair, especially on students that are from very, very low, low income backgrounds. All right. Um, um, now let's also talk about um, the, let's take the conversation into the out of school children um, numbers. Um, do you expect that those figures will increase after what 2020 has been like? And what would you also suggest that might um, help reduce those figures and bring more children to school at a time like this? Uh, you mentioned the school feeding program before. I'm not sure how successful that has been um, in keeping children you know, in school and, of course, uh, making uh, more kids go to school. Um, so what are your expectations moving forward? Um, as schools resume, do you think that we will be able to reduce the number of out-of-school children on the streets of Lagos? There's so many of them that you see in traffic every day um, and in the market. Um, how can that be fixed? Well, I um, believe that we're going to likely have a huge increase in out-of-school children, except we come up with initiatives to motivate both the children and their caregivers. Caregivers are likely going to say, look, I can't cope. You may have to drop out for now. The children may also end up being grossly discouraged if they feel that they are being, um, there's no equity. What do I mean by that? If they feel cheated, we are not the ones that asked the pandemic to come up. We are not the ones that caused the lockdown. Where are we the ones bearing the consequences? Why is it that children that their parents had generators, had Android phones, you know, could cope with online? And you know, the online classes also need home level support system. And even the on air classes need home level support system. So if apparently, or unfortunately, they had caregivers that are equally not educated, those children are going to be more challenged with coping with even the on-air and the virtual classes. And they are likely going to do, not going to do well at all in their exams. The most painful thing is that for most orphans and vulnerable children, they are only shot at um, going for tertiary education on time is to make their WIAC once and for all. Because sincerely, they don't really have anybody that is going to sponsor GCE or NECO exams for them. So that is another thing the government can do because most of them will not do well in that WIAC, frankly speaking. But if the government comes up with initiatives to also give them maybe free NECO or GCE exam, you know, it's going to really encourage them to say, okay, this, I have a little time to go to lesson. And then, and they can also give them free lesson after their WIAC. So they don't have to be secondary school students, but the, the government can organize out of school lessons, free ones, maybe using school facilities in the evenings or something, and then give them free GCE and NECO exams so that they don't have to bear the cost of writing this again. For those that are not in graduating classes, yes, a beautiful way of motivating is the free food, uniforms, textbooks, and all the, let's free education be really free. That is the short, long and short of it. Let free education be really free. Let the children be encouraged and be motivated and let's not leave out even the teachers because they were extremely they and their families were extremely affected by the lockdown even for those in low income private schools and even the ones that are in high income private schools at least i know knew of a couple that were both teachers in primary schools and unfortunately they did not have an android phone so their school was doing online classes but their family could not tap into it they had to resolve to begging and I remember that my organization also supported them. Mm -hmm. So you see now that even those teachers 
what mindset are they coming in also to use to resume school? So they equally need some form of um, encouragement. Palliatives can also be given to these teachers. Children that are in, in, um, resuming school can also be given take-home palliative packs to support their caregivers with their feeding, especially if we want to introduce crash learning, which includes evening lesson. If the children are going to be in school from morning till evening, how can we have them have two meals in school? Even if it's a snack and a drink and then a proper meal so that the children are encouraged to stay back into school. They are encouraged to, to focus. They are not even bothered if you tell them to come for weekend classes. Yes, right. It absolutely. is interesting how you have given real practical solutions you know, to some of the things that we are not even paying attention to. And your analysis of students who are in vulnerable schools. Now, now let's take a look at a different category of uh, vulnerable students or differently abled persons as, you, uh, as they call it now. So the blind and the deaf, for instance, who already before now, uh, there's that's uh, inequality that exists between them and the normal children who go to normal school. What can be done at this crucial moment to be able to help them and bring them up to speed with their counterparts who are in the regular schools? Yes, I think part of what can be done for them is to give them learning hits. They can give them, uh, for those that are blind, they can give them recorders, that already have lessons recorded in them and they can just go home and listen to them they can give them already written notes and all that for those that are deaf you know and even the blind ones things already typed in their braille that they can read on their own and then give them a bit of the homeworks that they can go and run on their own at the same time they also need to be seriously motivated and encouraged to do some extra lessons, just like what I mentioned earlier. At this pace, the children have spent more than enough in holidays. So they may have to do a longer term, even if it is they come to school in Mufti after the school has gone on break. They may have to do a few extra lessons, even for the ones that are living with disability. They may have to support them with mobility so that because they need to have their caregivers being able to accompany them or somebody that is able to accompany them to school. So even the person accompanying them to school for, must be motivated. So even if it's transport support, whatever needs to be done, they can give some special incentives for lesson teachers, home lesson teachers. They can recruit. You know, we have so many youths that are not doing anything. NCC holders trying to get jobs. They can give them volunteer jobs. The government can support this class of youth, train them to be able to uh, maybe take like 10 children in home lessons. So they go maybe two or three times a week to the homes of these children, and they can have volunteers per community that can help these children with home lesson because their own kind of lesson is very, very peculiar. Ukuladebi, there's so much work that needs to be done. Um, in every direction that we've pushed this conversation, um, it, it seems to open up you know, new issues here and there. Um, now you've even just mentioned uh, home teachers. I remember during the lockdown how you know, they complained bitterly of um, unemployment and you know, zero work to be done because nobody, of course, will let them into their homes. Um, there's also the aspect with regards to um, the virtual learning um, and how much extra home support that is uh, needed for that to be successful. Um, I want to ask, um, I'm, I believe that there are associations that are responsible for um, both public and private schools uh, to run. Who do you feel should be able to push these concerns to the government? And I'm talking mostly with regards um, financial support from the government to schools to enable them to stay afloat and to um, enable some of these things to continue to run um, um, in general. Who do you think should push these concerns to the government um, and with the hope that the government will be able to fully assist? Okay, I think um, it starts with not even the associations or the schools or the, yeah, the associations or the schools. I think they can take 
not learnings even from the children. We need to start including the children in decisions we're making for the children. They can actually set up a structure where you can have dialogues with these children and let them give you ideas of what is workable for them. Secondly, Caregivers Forum goes a long way. I have a few caregivers um, forum. We can organize maybe per, per local government and have each school bring in maybe two caregivers to represent the school and have like a, a, a meeting with them and let them give ideas. They will tell you what is workable at the home level. They will give the, uh, the government something workable at the home level. And this can also um, be applied to teachers. Also get teachers to bring in representatives across schools and get information from them. And they can also give the government, um, Ministry of Education ideas. Then lastly, we also look at bringing in representatives. All what I'm saying now has to be grouped. You have to bring them together in their own courts so that they can open up and share experience and knowledge, challenges, lesson learned. They, they prefer solutions to represent their own population. Public schools too should have such, and the same applies to low income private schools separately, and then high income private schools separately. This can now be annexed together by the Ministry of Education to come up, you know, the solutions that they prefer can then, they can set up like a committee that will look into it and look at the ones that are going to be adapted. When you make something participatory, even you don't rule out CSOs, bring on board um, NGOs and CSO representatives to bring in their own ideas. I am representing NGOs and look at the wealth of ideas that I've come up with. So you bring in like, 40 or 50 of us or maybe five of us per local government and bring us together and you'll be surprised at the kind of ideas that can be come up uh, that that can be brought up this all of what i'm saying are stuff that can be arranged within a week to two weeks and achieved it doesn't right. have to be cost um it doesn't have to be something expensive we have to use what we have right now to get what we need so that at the end of the day, we are having more resources available for the implementation. Absolutely. And we can have something that is workable, something that is adaptable, achievable, something that every single um, represented population accepts at their own, and they are going to make it sustainable they are going to accept it and they are going to ensure that it is achieved because right. they are going to feel that they are part of the entire planning. They are not going to feel left out in any way. Absolutely. Bukola Debi, um, thank you so much uh, for your thoughts and the wealth of experience that you've just shared with us. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, people in positions of power will also be listening and following up on some of these things that have been mentioned. We look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much. It's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. um, you know, like I said, you know, there's so much. Every time you have a conversation like this, you know, in every direction that you turn, mm -hmm. there's Something so much more from. that needs to be done. And what, one of the things I think COVID-19 has taught us, especially in different sectors, is to begin to consider doing things differently. Because even in her assessment, she mentioned a few practical examples of how to do things differently. For instance, she said they could even learn at home without uniforms, yes. you know, yes. and all of that. Like you said, hopefully our government... It would hurt consider. if we don't if we don't learn from what 2020 has taught us. Such an incredible um, year. Hello, hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.